Saturday night, there are those who seek a party that ends. And Saturday night, there are those who seek a party that never ends. We seek the party that never ends. And you? Center of all here is Jesus. All the rest, cathedral, assembly, and preacher, are only signum et rimandum of the one truth. This is the 22nd catechesis that we do here at Noto every first Saturday of the month. The theme is the incoronation of thorns to Jesus Christ. Now, he will try and see what this crown of thorns of Jesus might be and what these thorns that crown Jesus may be also for us and how we can actually withstand them when they come our way. In the video that I made to explain what we were going to do tonight in this catechesis, I did this kind of gesture that through the crown of prayer, we may, if we are attentive, withstand the crown of thorns to one day have the crown of glory, that is the crown of eternal life. Blessed eternal life. And also a crown of many brothers who from our continual yes to God will save many, many souls who instead of falling into hell for discouragement or discomfort uh, could be saved from the eternal fall into hell. Also through our words of help, our words of comfort. We will begin with uh, the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say after we read the passages of Jesus? Because uh, we're going deeper into the third sorrowful mystery. So we'll read the words of Jesus and also other scriptural passages in the Bible and also words of saints. Then following that, some uh, personal experiences. Uh, of my experiences, of other people's experiences. Now, I don't know if we'll manage to actually finish this in an hour. In that case, we'll have to do two parts to this video. From the Gospel according to Matthew. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe upon him and plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him, and took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. So we have three scriptural passages in the Gospel which actually narrate this uh, scene clearly. Matthew, Mark and John. And in Matthew it says, And plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. In Mark it says, and plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And John says, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. So we can understand that they very clearly put this crown, this thorny crown over his head, on his head, uh, that would have penetrated his skin and into the bones. I think... Um, I'm not sure if you understand just what I'm saying, that this wasn't just any so-and-so, this was the Son of God. This is the Son of God, who teaches us how to accept these thorns with humility. So first we have to understand what these thorns are. We read in the book of Ezekiel what these thorns could be. We begin with the Old Testament. It's written, Do not be afraid of them nor be afraid of their words. Though bears and thorns are with you and you sit upon scorpions, do not be afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. 
and you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. So it's saying these people and their words will be like brares, thorns and scorpions. So the words of the wicked, the words of those who don't want to listen to the word of God or the words of the prophets, those who make fun of even you when you, when you say things that are true, because none of us here were born as friars or groups of prayer or, uh, or Christians in the sense that uh, well, maybe some of us were baptized as children and so on, but if we're here, more or less, it's because uh, one way or another we've been touched by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and therefore we've gotten closer to Jesus and the church. And so when they make fun of us, their words are like thorns or like uh, scorpions when they sting, poisoning our, our blood. So if Jesus, though, withstood all of these, it means that also we can overcome them too. Because remember that the Old Testament is always seen in the light of the New Testament. The book of Proverbs says that uh, who speaks without reflecting stabs like a sword. That is, when we speak without reflecting, it's like taking a knife and stabbing them. I remember in Ispica when I used to work in construction and I used to have to take uh, the tools like a pallet knife or a, um, a shovel, etc. And there was a phrase that we used to say, a phrase in which uh, it was very, uh, uh, a certain way said in its dialect is very rustic and so on. But um, we would say that before opening your mouth, make sure that it's connected with your mind. And you see, the Word of God says something very similar. Who speaks without reflecting stabs like a sword. But then this scriptural passage continues and says that the words of the wise heal. So, for example, someone could have hurt you, hurt your friends. So much so, for example, that maybe they want to commit suicide. Or even desiring to kill someone. And so there are those who actually you know, create devastation and damage with their words. But then there are those who speak with wisdom, who build, who heal. The words of the wise heal. My mother used to say, oh, don't worry about my son, just let it pass over you. Well, I can let it pass over me if I know, for example, that there's the justice of God. With the word that teaches me to forgive. So the Word of God teaches me also that I can make mistakes if I don't reflect. But often the case is that like animals, we can be instinctive. And, I'm, and one might suicide or kill because uh, they're unable to digest it. So the words of the wise often have to heal the damage that others, or even sometimes we, create with the words we say. And so there's another scriptural passage from the Psalms that says, Those who sharpen their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush the blameless, look at that, sharpen their swords. Imagine, as soon as I catch that guy, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say that, and that'll make him go crazy. This is the devil. This is the devil. To strike the innocent. So these guys actually know they're innocent. But they just want to strike them to make them go crazy. The scripture says in the second book of Samuel. These are the last words of David, the David, the second king of Israel. Godless men are like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, 
and they are utterly consumed with fire. You see, if you find a group of godless people, that is, those who do not want to reason, they're not like just one or two thorns, they're like a whole shrub of thorns, where between you and them you have to like uh, put something between you to say like, I've got things to do, please, the Christian always has something to do. And the iron symbolic of firmness, that is, you know, you need to stay in your place. I remember one day on my way back from Mexico in the aeroplane, um, that we find also, not only in the church, but also in uh, the armed forces, where there are people who don't want to reason. And there were some officers that uh, wanted to insult me, wanted to make fun of me. It wasn't the law enforcement itself, it was those people that worked for it. And so I said to them, well, this is where a civil law ends and this is where God law begins. So if you're going to continue to insult me, like, I need to keep moving, like, stay away from me. And so immediately they said, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So sometimes the uh, pole of steel between you and them, the, the firmness uh, can uh, help them understand. That is, the firmness of the way you speak can help them understand. Otherwise, uh, they might uh, prick you with their insults and then it might uh, get infected in some way or another. And then there are the thorns of those who don't want to do anything at all. That is, um, the scripture even says that uh, laziness, People who are lazy are like thorns. The book of Proverbs says that uh, the way of the lazy is like a bush of thorns. And the way of the upright is a clear path. So the way of the lazy, those who don't want to help, those who don't want to meditate, those who don't want to do anything at all, those who don't want to work or do any charity at all, speaking always badly about the others, etc. This isn't a thorn, but a pathway choked in thorns, not a clear path at all. Imagine what kind of a path that would be like with all those thorns. So we're now thinking about the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. We don't actually have to imagine like making a crown of thorns and putting it on us, but these are sort of the things that Jesus actually experienced. And this thing could happen. No. But this is what concretely the thorns actually are. Now this is what in regards to disobedience, when God says one thing and we do another. Also here, people like this are also worse than thorns. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. We're talking about Genesis where Adam and Eve, Adam listening to his wife and disobeying God. So, so it doesn't have to speak about just a woman, it's referring to someone listening to another who listened to the devil. The devil is everything that is against what is written in the scripture. His name is Satan. So whenever we listen to things that are outside of the revelation, outside of the word of God, that's what we call listening to Satan, and our lives don't produce roses and flowers, but instead thorns and thistles. It doesn't produce anything good. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, when you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Now I'm going to jump over a little bit. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And so it says that they will be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. Now, Jesus, he ate with the publicans and the sinners, whilst here it says that if you are alongside those who are not allied with God, they'll be like thorns in your eyes. Can you imagine someone with thorns in their eyes? Psalm number one comes to my mind where it says, 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, and in his law he meditates day and night. Anyhow, it continues to say that he's like a tree who produces fruit uh, even in time of drought and doesn't dry up or wither. So if we look at all the sinners of the world, all of those who may even be strangers to the law of God, according to the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus and his words, we can sit alongside these people. But if not standing like Matthew and remaining in their sins and persevering in their foolishness, we no longer remain blessed if we stay with them, but we will be blessed if we get up and get out of it. Otherwise, it'd be like shoving your face in thorn bushes. So the word of God is clear. So when they don't want to listen to you, it's a waste of time damning yourself. So what are you meant to do if you talk to them and they don't want to listen to you? What do you mean you don't know what to do? It's written in the gospel. Jesus says that we hear it so often. You get up and you leave. The Gospel says it clear, get up and go in another place, shake the dust off your sandals. The dust means the iniquity of the distractions, don't let that stick to you. Not because they are bad, it's true they might indeed have a spirit of evil within them, but it's also true that they may not be mature enough. You might say, well I lost my peace now, I don't know what to do about them. Well, do you want to make yourself superior to Jesus who tells you, get out of there? I tell it to you from experience that when someone fixes themselves on trying to convert someone who doesn't want to listen, it damns your soul. Why do I have to do things on my own ahead? Jesus tells me the way to peace. Even if someone insults me, I've still got peace. Apostasy. That is, when someone who no longer continues to be a Roman apostolic Catholic because they look at the defects of others. Ah, the Church is all corrupted, the bishops are all sinful, also the priests, also the religious, all of them, according to some. I leave the church because there are statues, because they're all rich. Boop, 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 boop. This is apostasy, the sin of schism, when someone has been recalled and they perseveringly don't change, heretical and schismatical. What happens if someone does this? Of course, there's always the opportunity to convert, to change and return. But because also Judas asked forgiveness, but he didn't change. The Gospel says that he actually repented, but then he went and hung himself, remained in his mentality and lost everything. In the book of Joshua it says, Take good heed to yourselves, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back, and in Italian it actually says apostatize, and join the remnant of these nations left here among you, and make marriages with them so that you marry their women and they yours, know assuredly that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations before you, but they shall become a snare and a trap for you, a scourge on your sides and thorns in your eyes, till you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. So for example, if someone obstinately, after having known the Roman Catholic Church, that as the Second Vatican Council says, that I know has the fullness of the means of salvation, Therefore, it has all the means, everything I need to be saved. And then along comes someone and says, No, the fullness of the truth is not here. And then I listen to him and go. It's like shoving thorns and thistles into my eyes. It doesn't mean that I'm not to befriend those people who aren't Catholic. What it means is that if I begin to marry their heresies, their errors, I begin to lose my means of salvation. For example, I once had a car, now I don't have it, I have to walk. Or I once had a house, now I have to sleep outside. Or I once had clothes, now I'm nude. These are the means. Therefore, the further away from the Catholic Church that you go, the less means that you have, and the worse your life will become. 
and the closer the death will be at our side. This scriptural passage is figurative of this. Of course, we are for ecumenical dialogue and also, of course, interreligious dialogue. What's important is that we understand when we need to change, to convert. You know what the measure is, how we can understand? It's when we lose our peace. That's right. When we are out of the way of Jesus, both his head and his body, that is Jesus and his Roman church, of course the other churches has parts of his body. The more we leave that fullness, the more peace we lose. Other thorns. The shepherds who should be doing their work as shepherds, but don't do their work as shepherds. From the book of Jeremiah. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have tied themselves out that profited nothing. They should be ashamed of their harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. So these are people who have been called to be shepherds. At the image of the lamb who shall be their shepherd. Jesus speaks about the lambs and the sheep. The lambs are those who give their whole life to the Lord. The sheep are those who are the ones that follow the shepherd, who in turn must be the lamb. This is a personal interpretation that I also shared with a bishop at Rome who also agreed with me. So the Holy Spirit also confirmed its correctness. So when someone is called to be a pastor, and not any this or that pastor, instead of being a pastor being a lost sheep, but instead being a Roman Catholic pastor, a shepherd, could be a bishop, priest, a pope, or a cardinal, etc., and they're not interested in the sheep. And someone might say, look, if you do that, a lot of people will be lost. Look, if you do something like that, a lot of people are going to lose their way. And they say, patience, we have to have patience. And then you see after 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, you will have noticed that they haven't gathered any fruit. They might start with, for example, five, then uh, three, then two, and then nothing. They become sad and ugly. I tell you, it's like this. When someone does this, they become thorns to the church and to themselves. And their work does not bear fruit because they're, they're not blessed by God. So, if someone has been called to be a shepherd, to give everything to the Lord, and they also answer the call, there are other scriptural passages that also confirm this, that they have to persevere. If they get lazy, relaxed, they risk losing a lot of souls. For example, one priest, a Sunday, he gets up and decides to say from the pulpit that I've decided to marry. I can't be a priest any longer. And the people say, oh, poor thing. Can you imagine just how many people lose themselves over a decision like this? If God has called you, you have answered to say yes and set a promise in front of God and in front of others. You have to maintain that promise. If you leave that, well, Lord, we really pray that the Lord illuminate these people because it is really a damnation, this kind of behavior. Of course, there's the mercy of God. There's also space for repentance. One can always change and recuperate everything that was once lost, but it's very dangerous. And so the scripture says that these kind of shepherds have sown grain, wheat, but then they have gathered thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. See, after all these years, their words no longer have any weight. No one really listens. Their work no longer bears fruit. God, save us from this. I prefer to die than this. Working all your life and not bearing fruit, because your words no longer have weight. If you make a promise and then don't maintain it, you have to ask for forgiveness. You have to start again from the beginning. If you don't do this, your words will become ignored. No one will listen to you. I made a mistake. What's the problem? A donkey's got a head so big and it makes mistakes. I can't make a mistake with such a small head. That's what they say in Catania. Like, we can all make mistakes. It's clear. 
What's important is that we admit it, because he who does not confess his errors, says the scriptures, will not have success. So what he does is no longer blessed by God. They are thorns. The next theme, when someone insults us, shh, don't answer. Why well, this guy's a saint because he didn't answer. Where is it written that we don't have to answer? You have to answer with humility, with charity. I have to answer. The Word of God says it. Whoever insults me, I will give an answer. Jesus says to the man who struck him, Why do you strike me? If I've done nothing wrong, in Sicilian there's a phrase, timbolata, means like a punch to the face. Why do you strike me? If I made a mistake, demonstrate it to me, show me. But otherwise, why do you hit me? But then, if they don't listen to you, what are you going to say? Yeah, then you can be in silence. A little ahead, we'll uh, see how a saint teaches us how we are to answer these kind of insults. Often, uh, whilst we're evangelizing, we come across... Uh, many different types of thorns, people who insult us, uh, different ways of giving us thorns. Now the scripture says, break up your fellow ground and sow not among thorns. Now if I sow amongst thorns, Jesus will explain it in the gospel that I start to suffocate and don't gather any fruit. Jesus, in the parable of Matthew, Jesus in the parable of Mark, and Jesus in the parable of Luke. When he talks about the thorns, when he first explains it as a parable and then ex explains the meaning of the parable to those who are closer to him. Let's read Luke and then we'll compare it with the other synoptic gospels. The seed that fell amongst the thorns, they are those who hear the word, but they go on their way and they are choked by the cares and the riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. So it says here, after having listened, and one could say, well, I've listened now and then, but in the Gospel of Matthew, it actually says, after having listened to the Word of God. Matthew says, so it is he who hears the Word, but the cares of the world and the delight in riches choke the Word, and it proves unfruitful. So you see, if someone doesn't listen to the Word, <laughs> And then what, what am I going to do? Uh, oh, this anxiety. Wait, where, where, how am I going to be able to live? What if I have to go to hitchhike to France? And then if I don't have a woman, how am I going to be able to survive? And then if I, if I have to beg for food, and then if someone strikes my wife, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to kill the guy. I'm going to shoot him. But what shoot anyone? The gospel says, turn the other cheek. You have to turn the other cheek. Once this uh, guy who was in our community once said, uh, if someone touches a nun, one of these nuns, I'll strike them down to the ground, I'll punch him in the face. I said to him, you ain't raising no hand. And he said, well, I can't do it. He said, you have to do it because with the grace of God, you have to do it because Jesus says, turn the other cheek. You're a friar. Can you imagine one friar, two friars, three fires going into a fight like that? You can't raise your hand. Imagine if someone takes a video of you punching, punching people out. You know, they might not have seen the, what happened to the sister. So what are you meant to do in these situations? You can hold them back. Jesus never said you can't hold people back. To turn the other cheek, that is like, avoid war. Peter said, well, if they touch Jesus, well, I'm going to cut their head off. Well, he missed and cut his ear off. But what does Jesus say? You must put your sword back into its scabbard or sheath. Otherwise, what's the difference between us and the world? The world says, they can do anything to me, but if they touch me, I'll kill them. Congratulations, you're still in the Old Testament. Nature wants us to rebel. But God tells us that you have to stay on the cross. Do the nails hurt you, or the thorns? 
If you want to resurrect, you have to stay on the cross. So, Luke says, worries of the world, riches, and pleasures. Worries. Wealth. <gasps> Mamma mia, without money. And then I'll be poor. And then other worries. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And then the pleasures. Ah, oh, they're so good, these things. They're so good. I don't know how I can do without them. I just, I don't have the strength to control myself. Go for it. St. Francis of Assisi says, the brief is the pleasure and eternal is the damnation. <laughs> well, you know, just imagine it. Put your hand over a, a lighter just for a little while and see how that feels. Think of all eternity. St. Clair of Assisi says that brief is the effort and eternal is the reward. Now Mark, he says, worries, wealth, and adds covetousness. So he no longer says pleasures, but covetousness, which is it's like a like a, a desire for for everyone else's things, a, a, a thirst for, for for everything. You know, there was a guy that came to our community, and you know, with all good respect, he was a good guy, but um, uh, he came to have an experience with us and. But he said, well, I can't live without cigarettes. He said, okay, don't worry, we'll get you an electric one and uh, slowly, slowly we'll reduce it until you give up. He said, no, 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 I can't live without cigarettes. But he, said, he also said that he had like some kind of vision of Padre Pio saying that he had to be a friar in our community and, and so anyhow, this I can't do, that I can't do, this I can't live without this or that. What ended up happening was he not only left the community, but he even left the Catholic Church. He ended up taking some steps backwards in his faith. And so for those who have had the experience, they'll understand. And um, there is even um, someone who we know amongst us who, who has had a similar experience, who they left the Catholic Church. And to re-enter, uh, the Church even asked them to do two years of fasting of the Eucharist so that they would uh, learn well their lesson. So the Church, uh, to teach us uh, to think twice before we do something like that, to tell us that, you know, before you do it, you've got to think twice, you know, like, why do you do something uh, foolish like that? So why do these things happen? It's because we allow ourselves to be taken by these thorns, that the thorns and thistles grow, and the seed that of uh, the seed of the Word of God inseminated in our hearts, it becomes suffocated, it doesn't grow, it doesn't see the light, it sees nothing but the darkness. So have you learned what uh, uh, Jesus means by the thorns now, what these thorns actually are? W, R and P, that is worries, riches and pleasures, or W, R and C, worries, riches and covetousness. This is what they are. Jesus says, why do you worry about food to eat? Why do you worry about these things? These are the things that the people of the world worry about. I have to admit to you that I'm the first one that starts to worry. Uh, I get afraid, uh, even after 20 years of doing this, that uh, hitchhiking, like without anything to France, or if I go to Rome or Milan, I wouldn't say that it's actually fear, but I worry, you know, where am I going to sleep for the night? What am I going to eat? Where am I going to stay? Am I going to sleep outside tonight? You know, I'm, I admit, I get tempted by these worries. But the Lord is always punctual, pum, to be able to give us providence. Now this story I always recount when uh, in Cosenza, when there was a cold, cold chill. It was cold. And it was actually the first time we actually went to the cathedral. I didn't know Cosenza then. Now I know it well. And so the vehicle dropped us uh, right out the front. And so we stepped out and our toes were cold. It was cold, uh, shaking, freezing. And so worrying about who knows where we're going to sleep for the night, we stepped into the cathedral and um, there happened to be uh, Bishop Mon Monsignor Brigantini. He used to be uh, the Bishop of Locri. They had, they, they had only made him just then, recently, the Bishop. 
Um, he's now the Bishop of uh, Campobasso. And you can see he was dressed in a very sober way. And so remember that my worries were about what I was going to eat, where I was going to sleep for the night. And so there was the Bishop there uh, from the pulpit saying, why do you worry about what you are to eat? Why do you worry about what you are to wear? Look at Mary. Mary didn't worry about these things. She ran in haste towards the hill country without worrying about these things. Why do you worry about what you are to eat? Why do you worry about where you are to sleep? And so I, who had just stepped into the church and heard those words were wow or in French ooh la la and so you know earlier my heart was beating du -du -dum, du -du -dum. And, and this temptation comes to me all the time and it's not like because I'm a friar for 20 years I don't have anymore this temptation still come to me so after Mass, uh, we went to go and uh, visit the bishop uh, to into the, the sacristy, which is was here on the, on, the, on the left. And as we were walking there, we heard someone call, Brothers, brothers! We turned around and said, Who are you? And then we saw that there were, there were the Capuchin fathers there calling us, saying, Brothers, who are you? Uh, yeah, we're a new community, uh, like uh, the Franciscans, we live off Providence, uh, uh, and we're heading towards north, we hitchhiked it here, and we we're actually uh, looking for a place to stay for the night. Oh, brothers, don't worry about it, you come with us, you stay with us tonight, we'll give you all the food you need and you can stay for the night. We'll immediately give you a hot tea to warm you up. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. You know, like, it was cold there. If we had to sleep outside, we may have died. But, you know, even if that was the case, like, is there not the resurrection? Not immediately after death, but uh, at the end of time on the last day. If I believe in the resurrection, and that if I die in grace, doing God's will, well, then why do I have to worry? It's because there's the devil with his little fork that wants to prick us in the, in the mind, in the heart. Uh, he wants to make us worry. He makes us uh, ugly, worried, sad. We don't give a witness to anyone or anything. Instead, you know, when these things happen, then, then we say, oh, man of little faith, <laughs> why did I have to worry about all of that? So, okay, uh, let's move on now. Uh, the thorns, obviously, we're talking about. Uh, now, so there's Saint Paul, who speaks of the famous thorn in the flesh. And so he says, And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, he was, because he saw the third heaven, he could have said, Well, hey, hey, I saw Jesus. I spoke with Jesus. It says that he was given a thorn. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. What is this thorn in the flesh? I often wondered this. We'll uh, describe this later on in the meditations. But anyhow, it says here, it uses a terminology. He says, a messenger from Satan was sent to me to harass me. In Italian, it's actually to beat me up. You imagine if uh, one of you goes to pray, and then uh, you step out of your prayer, and then pum, 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 someone hits you. When you go to church, then again, pum, 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 someone else hits you. Then another one, pum, 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 hits you. You start to ask, well, what's going on? Maybe there's a message here. Well, maybe if you, you see if you've understood this catechesis, maybe what it means. Because here it's written that uh, the angel of Satan was sent to keep St. Paul humble. This actually happened to me once, yeah, uh, always it was in Calabria in fact, uh, where this huge guy came up to me, like this high, and uh, he said to me in a uh, Napolitan accent, he said to me, where is uh, the girl? He struck me with his hand, <laughs> uh, with a ring that was on his finger, it really hurt, hit the back of my head here. 
And so, thanks be to God, I changed my character from the hot-headed guy that I used to be. Now that I'm a friar, I've uh, learned how to be more, more calm. And so, I, I took a few moments to reflect as it ha- uh, after it happened, and I thought to myself, you know, and it was the Holy Spirit speaking, you know, but I, I thought, how often does it happen that you get a chance to live the gospel like this? When Jesus says that if someone strikes your right cheek, turn and give them your left. I said, this is unique opportunities. And so I said to him, hey, whilst you're at it, why don't you finish it off? And I turned my other cheek to him. He actually got afraid and he took two steps backwards and then turned off and left. So I said to him, my name is Fry Valentino, what's your name? He got into his car and then... But I did also tell him earlier that have you ever read in the Bible that anyone who struck a consecrated person got away with it alive? And so I said to him, don't worry about it, you go and confess, it'll be all over. So that time, at least, it worked out well. You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't get angry, thanks be to God. So you could say, this demon was sent to me to strike me in a certain sense to keep me humble, because otherwise I could say, ah, I am this, I am that, I am the general servant, you know. And so that time it turned out well. But there are other times that I don't do it so well, I get angry. What do I do? I go back to confession. Uh, yeah, even, uh, even myself. Uh, start again. St. Peter says that when we are insulted and we manage to stay calm, says that the spirit of glory is resting upon us. Let's read it. What does it say? Beloved, do not be surprised that a trial by fire is occurring among you, as if something strange were happening to you. But rejoice to the extent that you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice exultantly. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, Blessed are you. Listen to this. Blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Why? Now, this is St. Peter who explains this, but Jesus already said it in the Beatitudes. He said, Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. So if we manage to support with patience the suffering, the insults and persecutions with a sense of calm and peace, well then as this is what is pleasing to God. So the Christian has to stay calm. You know, we have to stay attentive to this uh, and not distracted. Because if the Lord could say, well, if you come into church and whilst the word is being said and we turn our faces and ears elsewhere, even our prayer becomes an abomination. And so we have to try to be awake and attentive. It's difficult, but the prize is high. It's the resurrection of the body. Eternal life, eternal beauty, eternal happiness, beatific immortality. And also to say that we have to weigh our words. My father, my earthly father, used to always say to me, we need to weigh our words. Because St. James actually says that for if anyone does not fall short in speech, he is a perfect man. That this perfect man is able to bridle his whole body also. So we need to control our tongue and our hands. As our words have to be weighed and we have to say 
what is necessary, the Word of God. Um, otherwise, a bit like uh, as we've already spoken about in the book of Proverbs, where it says that who speaks without reflecting stabs like a sword. St. Augustine says that the sword of the tongue is more dangerous than the sword of steel. That is, so if like St. Peter, someone picks up a sword and cuts off the ear of someone, you know, uh, those people may may still be able to hear, for example, even if the, the, the ear is cut off. But if someone tricks you or even scandalizes you, well, you won't be able to listen to what the church teaches anymore in a certain way. You see, in that way, you've done more damage than with the sword of the tongue than the sword of steel. When we don't weigh up our words and we offend people, we truly can make people go crazy by the things we say. We have a huge responsibility as human beings, as Christians, and as Catholics. Saint Dorotheus Abbot. The man who thinks that he is quiet and peaceful has within him a passion that he does not see. A brother comes up, utters some kind of word, and immediately all the venom and mire that lie hidden within him are spewed out. If he wishes mercy, he must do penance, purify himself, and strive to become perfect. He will see that he should have returned thanks to his brother instead of returning injury, because his brother has proven to be an occasion of spiritual profit to him. If someone insults you, at least once it's good that you say, brother, you're right, I could do better than uh, what I was doing before. Or like what happened on uh, WhatsApp the other day, there was someone that told me uh, that that person you have to leave alone. Now, I was trying to help this person from a way of error back into the Catholic Church and this other person was saying, you have to leave that person alone. If not, I'm going to come to Norta and I'm going to make you a martyr. And then came to my mind the phrase of St. Francis Saviour, at least I think it's him. Um, and I said to him, hey brother, there's a saint that says, more than kill me, you can't do anything worse. You know, and even if you don't do that and you maybe rip one of my eyes out, I'll still have another eye to look at you and to say to you that I wish you well. So calm down brother, you know, there's no need to get all agitated. And, uh, and so he ended up like coming down. He actually threatened me with my life and I told him, well, you know, I don't, I'm not afraid of that because there's Jesus who's resurrected. I don't have to be afraid of you. So I can say whatever I believe. I used to be afraid of people who would point a gun at me and it still might happen to me now, but it's up to a certain point. But uh, what I need to say, I have to say it to you. You know, I wish you well. And what it is you're doing is not good. So I'm a friar, and if I'm a Christian, and I, want, I wish you well, I have to tell you the truth. You know, I don't have to be afraid to tell you the truth either, with respect, and also in a delicate manner. But I have to say the truth. Otherwise, I'm like just one living off your backs. I'm a delinquent dressed as a friar. I have to say the truth. With all respect, you know, picking people up with the uh, silk gloves, if you could say so, with the ecclesial, human, theological, anthropological diplomacy. But I have to say the truth, otherwise I'm just a clown dressed as a friar. So we all have to convert, rather than speaking with words that are thorny, or like a sword that destroy and hurt people. We have to rather be those who speak by building up, by constructing, to help people back into the right relationship with God, people who do the right thing. So we're still in time, now we speak about St. Francis of Assisi. We were with the fathers of the church, now we're speaking of the medieval age. The Franciscan omnibus of sources say that Francis acclaimed patience more worthy than arrogance. Francis would not allow himself to be disarmed or to be defeated by any kind of insult. And he would thank God for all of his trials. In vain is the man who insults the upright man. 
man, because the more he insults him, the more he becomes victorious in his fight against evil. Franciscan sources say that humiliation makes one's heart more intrepid. You see that Francis, even though he might have been insulted, and uh, he always tried to speak well of the people. Now there's another phrase from the Omnibus of Sources that said that Francis, when the brothers happened to say some kind of offensive word to the brothers, now this is really important to pay attention to how they would behave. Now, they used to do this in the medieval ages, but remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, so if they would end up discovering that a brother insulted another, they would confess and say, Brother, because I am wrong and spoke badly, put your foot over my mouth. Otherwise, if you don't, I'll call the superior and tell him that you did not put your foot over my mouth, because this is what I am worthy of. We, at the beginning of our community, because we still hadn't done any philosophy, any theology, any psychology, we just had the Franciscan omnibus of sources, and because Francis did it, when we would say something offensive amongst us in our own community, we would do likewise. This uh, accusation recently has made its way all the way to Rome, saying that we step on the brothers' faces. This we used to do at the beginning when we were still infants in faith, you could say. Like St. Teresa of Lisieux speaks about that infancy of, uh, of a spiritual life. But, um, you know, not as if anyone looked at the context of the way we were doing it. No, the devil wanted to accuse us and wants to take those things taken as a, the spirit of a child all the way to the vicar of the Pope to accuse you, to the congregations. Why? To destroy the lifestyle that they couldn't manage to live. But the Lord laughs at these kinds of people that are tricked by the devil. But we need to pray for these people. These people who instead of looking at people who want to become saints, who want to imitate them with simplicity, in purity of intention. And so these people say, no, no, this doesn't enter into the logic of human anthropology. That this is something that they have not studied and it will not be able to be. No. These people are too simple and haven't studied, they need to study more, you know. Well, let's not forget the anthropology which is written in the gospel from Adam and Eve right up to today's Pope Francis through the history of saints. So looking at the lives of saints, they pretty much all say we need to not all put a foot over your mouth, but at least a hand over your mouth. That is, to watch what you say, you know, or at least to ask for forgiveness. Today no one wants to ask for forgiveness. How ugly is pride. Saint Rita, who was so inflamed by the passion of Christ, who one day along appeared a thorn in her forehead. This thorn, you know, the thorn of Christ, obviously. That, but one, I used to ask myself, what, what does this thorn symbolize? Why this thorn? And so the original fonts say that the thorn in her forehead uh, disappeared when... Um, when her superior sent her to Rome. And so I, in my reasoning, thought that there are some kind of thorns that torture us, maybe the people or superiors, for example, that when we are in communion with Rome, even if we have them, the pain disappears. Saint Anthony Maria Zachariah said that those who oppose us help our eternal crown grow. That is, the more that they combat you, the more that they say, you're a Christian and you're foolish, you are stupid, you are crazy, you are ignorant. Go and have fun in life. No. The more that they insult us and that we answer them with calm and in peace, the more our eternal crown in heaven grows. San Francesco di Sales, se sei accusato ingiustamente, 
Ecco qua. Allora, si deve rispondere so, quando ci insultano oppure no. Should we answer if we're insulted no, or should we not? Often there's that, that question. No, this guy's a saint because he doesn't answer. Tace. Ma questo dove è scritto? A nessuna parte. Prima si risponde, poi se quello non ascolta, allora ti stai zitto. St. Francis de Sales says, and he's a bishop and doctor of the church, he says, if you are accused unjustly, free yourself from this guilt. You have the right to free yourself from that fault with a sense of calmness. Prove to them your innocence. You have the right to prove that you are not guilty. You are obliged to serve the truth, even for the good example of the others. For example, if someone says, you're a fry and you're going out with women, you're sleeping with them. Well, hang on, I've got the proof. There was this person, that person with me, this person with me. I couldn't have been there. What are you saying? Obviously saying all this in, in, in calm and peace. But then after your sincere and honest explanation, it is sincere because no one can hide from God. A relationship with God has to be sincere. So after having explained this honestly and sincerely, and they still don't want to listen to you and reason with the proof, don't go into anguish nor lose your peace. So after having brought forward the truth, you then expose it with humility. So it's like Jesus, for example, he said what he said he could, they didn't listen to him. It's not like he, he damned his soul because they didn't listen to him. Yeah, he got beaten, he got punched, everything. But you know, we need to stay in peace. It's a lot like the Shroud of Turin, where you see the face of Jesus, which is in such peace. It's because he knew there was the resurrection to come. Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. Invece, se io mi arrabbio, so instead of actually taking out that thorn from your side, they actually then thrust it even deeper into your feet. And so we end our catechesis tonight here. Quello che Dio vuole da te